Welcome to The Gut Check, nutrition and gut health for active people, a podcast where we are talking functional nutrition for functional fitness and a functional you. Remember, if your gut is not functioning optimally, you are not functioning optimally. I am your host, registered dietitian and nutritionist and OCR fan, Kate Klein. You can connect with me on Facebook at The Dublin Dietitian or go to my website for additional resources, services, and the video recorded versions of these episodes at www.dublindietitian.com. That's D-U-B-L-I-N-D-I-E-T-I-T-I-A-N. As a standard disclaimer, the information provided here is for educational purposes only. While I strive to provide accurate and helpful information to my listeners and viewers, I cannot take into account individualized circumstances. This is not a substitute for personalized nutrition, health, and medical advice from a health professional. If you are ready to get your personalized plan, you can go to DublinDietitian.com and schedule a complimentary strategy session to get a game plan in place for you to hit your health and fitness goals. So let's get to it. Hey, viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in. We are talking about labs today, which is a really important topic from a functional medicine standpoint, especially if you feel like you go to the doctor every year and you're just continually told, hey, everything's normal. But then all of a sudden, after 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you develop some severe disease. You're diagnosed with diabetes or IBS or arthritis or chronic fatigue syndrome. But we know these conditions don't just happen overnight. It's not this on and off thing. It's a gradual progression. Maybe you swear that your thyroid must be off because you just can't lose weight and you are always cold. You've got thinning eyebrows, you know, whatever it is, but your doctors keep going, nope, your TSH level is just fine. Whatever the case is, generally, if you realize that you just don't feel like you and you're confused as to what's going on because your doctor insists everything is normal, you're just getting older, you're just stressed, or it's all in your head. Well, then I'm glad you're here because let's talk about that. In this episode, Andy and I are going to go over sort of the history of how the lab ranges came to be and where that started um, and how limited that selection actually was, and then how that has continued to evolve today into the ranges that we look at now. We discuss grouping of labs and markers such as thyroid being more than just TSH and T4, And then we get into the gag clause. Have you ever heard of that? Many doctors, unfortunately, are bound by it, and it is keeping you from getting all of your options. Then we talk a little bit about how the medical, pharmaceutical, insurance, and even the legal companies are kind of all tied together. What it means from your labs, why they may be, quote, normal, but not optimal, not where you could and should be. So that's what we talk about today. And last thing before we dig into the content is really, I just want to say any sort of engagement that you can offer is so, so meaningful to me. So if you can like, comment, subscribe, or better yet, share this video with somebody that you think would find it interesting or appreciate it, it really helps me with the algorithm to get these videos and podcasts seen and spread awareness for the people who are frustrated. And it means a lot to me as a creator and educator in creating this and other content. So all that said, let's get to it. So let's talk about labs. Talking labs because, again, there are different lenses in functional versus conventional interpretation yes. and ordering and which ones we use and all kinds of stuff. Wow. Um, and I know it, it is very common to hear things like, well, my doctor says my labs are normal, so no, it's not that. Or, well, they checked my thyroid. Yeah, my TSH was fine. Dot, dot, dot. So, um, I know one of the things we talked about, <laughs> um, was first getting into essentially how labs determine what their normal range is. And so I thought we could hit that, um, how labs determine that sure. and then what doctors look at, um, yes. kind of our, our current medical system does and how that's different. All so good know, topics. I'm excited. I, know what I have on. learned about how yes. labs come around, but I think you have learned some things too in your time. Mm-hmm. So why don't you start? Um, when did you get into this topic? Oh God. So when did I get into labs? Um, undergrad, I think actually is when I first started learning about labs. Um, and, uh, 
loosely how the normal ranges were determined. And many of the quote normal range lab determinants were taken from military studies um, early in the 1900s uh, uh, and in the 1950s um, and were largely white males of a young age in general. Um, not all labs, but the broad sweeping um, way in which most n normal range values have been determined was, well, let's just look at a subset of, hey, we've got military recruits. Military recruits, by the way, sign up to do all kinds of things. Um, one of which is we're going to just take blood samples and we're going to see what is normal within this group. And here we go. Here's how these normal ranges were determined. Well, that's great if you are a dude who's young and white. Um, some labs were like, okay, well, we're just going to take this huge data set and then see what fits in the normal range. That's another way that they, a lot of labs work, normal ranges were created. We're like, okay, let's just take this huge set and see what came out of it. Yeah. Now, the problem with that is what set of patients were you picking from? Because that's the other thing, D depending upon what set of patients you're picking from. So, for example, if you're looking at kidney labs and you're looking at kidney patients, well, kidney patients are already kidney patients. They already have a kidney problem. So maybe people who have a kidney problem aren't exactly the best group of folks for which to create a baseline. So there's lots of... <laughs> Lots of inherent issues, but go ahead. What did you learn? I'm, I'm... Uh, so yeah, essentially that because what where I got like the little light bulb was I was learning um, when I was getting th taught about what the functional range should be, and she said, "Well, it's going to be different for each place because or you'll have to kind of compare it to that lab's normal range." I'm like, "That lab's normal also range? True. Like, why not?" Also true. Goal? range. She goes, no, actually what happens is that the labs actually set the reference range and they define that normal range um, based on who they're testing. So yeah, kind of like you're say, saying, so that reference range is merely mm -hmm. representing the lab values of 95% of the patients that they're testing. So it can vary location to location. And I have seen that when I get people's graphic, labs yep. back and I'm doing yep. interpretations, those ranges, they're, they're similar, but they're, they're still different. It's not universal. It's lab to lab. And so Correct this changes over time as patients are added and the sample population changes as well. Um, and one of the things that she was seeing is that with the introduction of all these cholesterol lowering statin drugs, the normal value for cholesterol has continued to drop as a higher uh, percentage of the population is taking these statins. Correct. So, and then the other thing is that because of the way insurance is starting to work, Oh, God. Insurances are contracting with the physicians and mm. saying, you can only take these tests when it's absolutely necessary or we're not going to cover it. We don't want to do preventative. So now you're getting physicians who are taking people who are already likely sick and right. having problems and sending those to the labs Correct. and who are now compiling this new reference range. So the lab. Correct. So you're creating a pool. Yeah, it's a pool. Yep. It's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's a tainted yep. pool of unhealthy people or people yep. already kind of at higher risk. Yes. Um, so I'd like to give just, a... just tremendous pressure from these insurance companies to help minimize yes. costs. So yeah, so that's Here's another, how they came, that's what I was taught. Yes. And that, and, and that also, those are also very true factors as well. The lab, yeah. the, the yours lab was the original now, history and how it's evolved. Yes, exactly. The original history, how it's evolved. And then, as you said, the labs themselves set their own bell curve, 95% confidence interval, whatever falls outside, statistically speaking, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, 
And then, yeah, you'll get into this cycle, like um, you want to order someone's vitamin D status just to see how they are. And the labs go, why do you want it? Well, we think they might be low. Why do you think that? Do you have a previous lab to prove it? Well, no, I want this one. You need a previous lab to prove it first. So that first one has to come out of pocket in a, for a lot of insurance companies. And only then, if it proves that it's low, will they cover future. Right. Or, you know, the physician needs to state like, oh, a patient might, is de- experiencing signs of depression or, you know, whatever, seasonal affective disorder, yada, yada. yada. It's it, it, the insurance is a whole other. Yeah. Uh, that's But this yeah. is that example of how insurance is controlling our healthcare Dictating system. Dictating our healthcare, which is a um, backwards. <laughs> yeah. Bass backwards. Um, um, yeah, uh, and I, I, I completely agree. But, but another, another, I'm going to give you a good example of this. So an article came out shortly before COVID that um, human baseline temperature is actually not 98.6 degrees. Now, this article came out and said that, hey, we actually set, you know, this 98.6 was established in like 18 something as normal human baseline temperature. Well, over the past, however, 100 years, 150 years or whatever, since this, like, normal st- statistic was uh, established, we've become more sedentary. Our uh, basal metabolic rate has lowered. We are not as active. And actually, human baseline temperature has dropped. So um, this article actually was like, no, we did this huge retrospective study where we looked at hundreds of thousands of data points over hundreds of years and no human baseline temperature is actually closer to like 97.6 we've actually lost about a tenth of a degree every decade for the past hundred or so years so this article was published before covid so now we are here in covid guess what we're finding because everybody has to no fever (laughs) right so, because you, anytime you have to go in, and we're recording temperatures for everybody who has to go in and get checked before you, like, before you go to physical therapy, before you walk in the door to your doctor's office, you have to get your temperature checked, temperature checked, mm-hmm. temperature checked, temperature checked. Oh, guess what? We're confirming this giant retrospective study that said, hey, we think that this old statistic's wrong. We think it's actually this, and we have the, da- the current data to prove it. But now we have this essentially real-time study happening that's proving it. So there's a lot of opportunity potentially to do this from a lab perspective. But the problem is we have insurance industry and we have conventional medicine sort of driving this bus of, but it's normal and it's been normal. So we don't need to do anything about it until you're sick. That brings up two interesting thoughts. So that means, theoretically, someone who is showing 98.6 that we're shrugging off as healthy, theoretically could have a fever. Correct. Technically. And two, just because this is the new normal, does that mean that's healthy? Exactly. Is it bad that our metabolic rates and our right, core temperature has dropped? Egg. Bingo! <laughs> so that's a whole other topic. Normal doesn't right. always mean healthy. <laughs> exactly. And that and that that was exactly my point. So even though you are in it's these cool. quote normal ranges, does that necessarily mean that that is a healthy range? And so to get back to, for example, thyroid because we all i mean like that's such a good one such a common one yeah it's such a common one um like oh my gosh let me just let's just i cannot tell you how many friends i like how many friends i have how many women i know who have been normal thyroid, normal thyroid, normal thyroid, couldn't lose weight, couldn't lose weight, polycystic ovarian, whatever, 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 finally fought, fought, fought enough. And these are all very strong women who work in healthcare and are 
just as much of a bully as I am when it comes to pushing around their it's physicians to get what you have to be, but, but it's, it's shitty that you have to be, but the fact of the matter is, oh, go on a small dose of, of Synthroid and suddenly, oh, guess what? Everything's back to normal. Cause guess what? You did actually, you were subclinical, subclinical. I hate that term, right? Like, oh, you fit within the normal range. Well, I guess we'll try it anyway. Just fine. We'll placate the patient. Oh, look, it worked. So if it worked, does that maybe mean that we can't trust the quote normal lab values? Well, not only that, but Synthroid is a synthetic T4. Right. And a lot of times that, that whole assembly line, like, we can get into thyroid in detail, but yeah, a lot of people, they just get the TSH. Yeah. And if, and doctors will be like, well, it's normal. So you're all good. And it's like, well, no, because the TSH is what tells your body to make the T4. Right. So just because it's being told to make T4 doesn't mean your body is actually, right, actually doing T4. that. Yeah. Or it's making the T4, but your body can't convert it properly into T3. But now if we like megadose T4, then that poorly converting process can keep up a little bit, but let's still fix that problem within that right. assembly line. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. But yeah, the number of people I get who I talk to, I'm like, you know what, have we, ch have we checked thyroid? Like, maybe there's some thyroid. Oh, my TSH is fine. My doctor says it's not that. Okay, well, what about and fact, T4, T3, free T4, reverse T3, you know? Right, well, and that's the thing. And you start talking to doctor. Uh, you know, you start talking to doctors about anything more than, like, even just you push like beyond T3, T4, or even free T3, free T4, and they're like, you know. And how about the, the, the autoimmune markers of the TPO and. Forget it, like, forget it. Like, and if, God forbid, if, if everything else has come back, if you're, if you're, if you have gotten past TSH, T3, T4, and even free T3, T4, and those are, and, and they've all come back normal, you are like, God help you if you can get a regular physician to test TPO or anything else. Like, I can do it. I can order please, that. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> like, please give me their name and number. They don't exist. You need to be in the functional medicine world because here again, that insurance driving There's the bus no problem, problem, you know, becomes the point where you can't necessarily justify running the exam other you know running the test mm -hmm. you know it it's yeah well and that's kind of i wanted to, to segue into that too um we've, we sort of hit on it this with the normal versus subclinical um and insurance and again like insurance and our healthcare system and our standard standards of care are so unfortunately tied into pharmaceuticals. Yes. So that's the other thing, kind of those labs are looking at that range. First of all, it's kind of a skewy range and it changes lab to lab, location to location. But that is basically looking like- Because, huh? and geographically, right? Because right. you're testing- Different people. Different groups of people. So your yes. normal range for Ohio, different than your normal, like gonna have some geographic variability than your, your normal range for like, Florida or Massachusetts. Granted, it's not going to be huge or it shouldn't. Shouldn't be, but it's still different. But it's still going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not these, these set in stone things. Not something, you know, it's labs are science, but they're also art and you have to finesse kind of figuring out each person's. They call levels. it practicing medicine for a reason. <laughs> yes. It takes a lot of exposure practice. and practice and it's research. science. And actually looking at the person and seeing what fits with what they're saying and what yep. they're looking like. Um, but yeah, so so with that that tie between health insurance and pharmaceuticals, the standards of care are kind of looking like, okay, here's our within normal range labs. And if you're within normal range, we're not doing anything. It is not till you've whoop, fallen right off the cliff that we can go ICD-10 diagnosis, prescription medicine, official label, yep. and now we'll deal with you. Right, exactly. And God forbid, when you fall off that cliff, you fall off that cliff 
with several different things and hit a couple rocks on the way down because now you're polypharmacy and it's one medication potentially causing a side effect that affects something it it Yeah, the, the anti-migraine medicine that is a depressor to help reduce that, that neuro excitement now makes you exhausted. So now you take this thing to be an upper during the day and that one causes mm -hmm. diarrhea. <laughs> yep, yep. So yeah, so and that's, that's kind of one of the key differences with functional nutrition versus conventional. We are not waiting till you hit that cliff and you fall off. We are looking at where before that do we want you to optimize? Where can we go, hey, you're moving in the Where wrong direction, yeah. and how, we don't want do we, you to fall. Yep. How do we, instead of having, like, Aries Rack pl Plateau, how do we, how do we build a wider hill for you with slopes, if we need yeah. to? Like, prevent. We, prevent before you start that yeah. snowball how tumble. Do we, how, do we, how do we, instead of have you on this, like, pillar where you have an edge to fall off of how do we create like a nice rounded mound for you to be on where like you have room and space to not just teeter off and now be like bloop, like boom yeah yeah that's and that's that's my goal mm -hmm. and there's a whole lot like um that we can see in those labs that go beyond these diagnoses. Like there are certain labs, if all of these labs are a little bit off, like they're not out of range, but they're a little high or a little lower compared to optimal. Well, if all of those group together, that indicates you probably have some oxidative stress and we need right. to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Or this one deals with like, maybe you're a little anaerobic and oxygen isn't getting through your body correctly for some reason, maybe stress, breathing, iron, you know, blood. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah, but there's thing. all these clues. <laughs> yes. And that, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I, I love that you brought that up because I think that's the other big, big problem with conventional versus functional. Conventional, you wind up with, I look at this silo. I look at this silo. I look at this silo. I look at this slice, this slice, this slice. You don't necessarily have, even your primary care provider, right? Mm -hmm. God love GPs, God love PCPs, they do what they can, but they don't necessarily, A, look at all the labs that need to be looked at, and B, they don't have the training and the mindset. They don't have the viewpoint of functional medicine that looks at oxidative stress. They don't have the viewpoint that looks at um being anaerobic and why are you not uh able to appropriately carry oxygen through your blood are you any you know like what what's happening here what are these different factors that are causing yeah. some of these issues so thank you i think that that's a really good other call out is that it is all of the other small clues that functional medicine can pull together and get from this really broader viewpoint um, and more detailed information that conventional medicine just kind of ignores. They just don't necessarily look at things through that same lens. If it, you know, like if it's not a sort of binary diagnosis of, yes, you are hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, or you have, uh, an autoimmune disease and marker that we can treat, you know, it's so yes, no binary. Yeah. That yeah. all that middle ground gets missed. It gets missed. And it's, it's kind of like that puzzle piece analogy we've talked about, you know, yep. looking here, looking here, looking here and not kind of scattershotting everything. And um, yeah, that's why I, I don't know a single functional medical practitioner who does less than one hour for their first appointment with a person. 
you know, mine, I have, it's like a 15 page health history because I want to know, are you traveling a lot? Because guess what? If you fly a lot, they are spraying that airplane down with all sorts of pesticides. If you go international and I, that might be toxic burden. Um, how are your fillings? Let's look at mercury. Do you have a sensitivity to bonfires? Cause that can indicate certain things and you know, all this yeah. stuff that mm -hmm. it all matters. And, and yeah, my, some of the, the appointments I've sat in on, maybe two hours for that first consultation. And I get that doctors don't have that time because yeah. of, again, our system is just the because way it the way is. The system is structured. Yep. So they can't do that. Nope. And, and that's also, again, when it comes to insurance, like I get a lot of people are like, why can't you take insurance? Like, because they won't let me have that time with you. Yeah. My, as a dietitian, like when I was working in clinical and trying to get uh, help out in our dialysis yeah. unit they're like oh that person who has end-stage renal disease like on dialysis gonna die if they don't sit in this machine three days a week you can talk to them for 30 minutes at a time three times a year maybe six i, I forget the exact number so i'm like six. you can't yeah, it's, it's, this it's person's exactly. lifestyle was so bad they are like uh, like just like this yeah. is not a healthy person this isn't like i'll just lose 10 pounds like they need to do a lot to kind of bring yeah. what they can back and that's it in an entire year that's all the time i went to school for years and i spent we spent weeks on kidney health yeah i can't teach that to them and help them implement it in that little time so that's you know and they won't cover labs so well, you know, that's, and, and, and well and like what is it like four or six visits a year for someone who has diabetes okay. um you know and it's like a half hour appointment and uh you know and there's the, only and, certain and the, things you're allowed to talk to them about there's only certain things that you're allowed to talk to them about and oh by the way um there's only certain conditions like when i i, I mean i was 100 pounds heavier than i am right now i had uh a hip replacement um, I'd blown out a knee. I mean, it was, it was a shit show. And I was like, I need to be working with a dietitian. Like I have all of the information. Something is not working. I need, like, I, I know this shit. Something ain't right. And my insurance company was like, well, you don't have a qualifying condition to speak with a nutritionist. I was like, are you, are you, are you kidding me? Food is medicine. We've known this since Hippocrates. <laughs> I'm like, and they're like, yeah, you don't have a qualifying condition to speak with. Uh, uh, and I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And they're like, well, you're not like, you're not super morbidly obese. You're not, or hyper morbidly, super hyper morbidly obese. I forget what the specific the category of terminology of was 40. yeah it was like a bmi of 40 or more and i was only at like 37 or something like that. i mean it was like the the level of minutia was just absolutely ridiculous and here i was just trying to be like i need to get healthier and that's just that to me is a broken system mm -hmm. well and i I know there's a lot of criticism too, because <clears throat> a lot of medical conferences and conventions are funded by pharmaceutical companies. Big Pharma! And I will be the first to admit, even the, what used to be the Academy, I'm sorry, it was the American, I forget what it's called before, the ADA, American Dietetic Association. They've been funded by like McDonald's and Coca-Cola. And uh -huh. it's like, Yes, yep. I'm still a member because it allows me to group with the functional nutritionists that are a subgroup and we, but we, Oh my God. It's, it's a joke. It's an yeah. absolute, like, yeah. Yeah. There are battles between conventional dietitians and functional dietitians. It's. I, and, and yeah. Well, but and, and follow me, the money. And for me coming from, you know, an academic background and working with, you know, like I worked with the clinical and translational research center at Ohio state. I worked with their bio nutrition department, like super functional. I mean, they were getting down to the nitty gritty of some of the, some of the researchy science of functional medicine, right? Because she, I mean, bionutrition is like, let's go to the one step below that feeds functional medicine, functional nutrition, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was just amazing to me, some of the, some of the stories that 
she would share from some of these traditional it was like how 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 is that how does that resonate it was such cognitive dissonance to me yeah so it's it's yeah the, and and the labs unfortunately it all ties into this is it's such a messy web of Unfortunately, the money is in pharmaceuticals yeah. and health insurance. There isn't money from like farmers <laughs> to yeah. put towards produce. And even when the government steps in and does stipends, it's like corn yeah. and soy. <laughs> Yo. So we won't go down that road today. Yeah, I was going to say that's, that's another conversation <laughs> for another. That's a different topic. But this, we this web. For that conversation. The what? We will need whiskey for that conversation. <laughs> but. So yeah, it's, it's a tight web between the pharmaceutical industries, the health insurance industries, and what they are dictating. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's, that's how it feels. And I know there yeah. are doctors who are frustrated by that. I, I was yeah. appalled in school. We had to take a medical ethics class as part of it. And a lot yeah. of it was just like, you know, being a decent right. person and not sharing right. private stuff. Right. But we learned about the gag clause. Are you familiar with the gag clause? yes <laughs> Kate please deliver so if I'm recalling right because you know this was like almost two decades ago but the gag clause was the idea that insurance would only let the doctors offer certain solutions to a patient that came in like if they were complaining about something your options were a b or c based on what the insurance told you that was the gag clause the only way around it the patient had to know that they could go what are my other options and only correct. then the doctor could elaborate on other things such as lifestyle changes correct. or correct yes so that correct. that blew me away that was in school and it wasn't even like this functional nutrition this was conventional dietetics yep. at the university of cincinnati like yep. normal standard good program yep and I was like, are you kidding me? Yep. That. And you know what, Kate? You, you know what's <laughs> appalling? That still exists. Yes. And you know what the worst part about it is? You know who's well educated? You know who actually receives training in patient education about lifestyle change and behavior change? Nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The nurse practitioners are not allowed to practice at the top of their licenses because of the gag clause, because unless a patient knows to ask. And even then, like I feel, so I've heard some stories, I will leave out names, but someone I, I, says they would go to their doctor and again they've got you know the doctor kind of provides whatever options and this person goes okay what would you recommend what do you think is best and the doctor goes your choice I'm like you are the doctor yeah. <laughs> like i yeah. want you to know what's best for me so i don't know where that's coming from i don't know if that's have you heard that before i don't know if that's like a just a so, situation or if there's yes. now some legal ramifications and insurance ramifications that are causing this um yeah, so that's, that is becoming it's more like a of a, issue? yes, that's becoming okay. more of a malpractice issue. Um, okay, so now we're roping lawyers. <laughs> yes, yeah, so and now we're, we're roping lawyers in, and it, and it, and a lot of it's because of physicians not wanting to make a recommendation, because, you know, on, in, and it depends upon the physician. Like there are some that still will. There are some that would say, you know, based and and it depends upon the phrasing because there are plenty. I love the Wonder Woman. There are plenty that will say, um, you know, for example, my GYN will say, this is this option, these are the statistics related to successes, failures, blah, 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 blah. This is this other option, these are the successes or failures related to da, 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 da. 
and you know in a patient of your age and with your history these are the you know if you went with this this is what i would be concerned about if you went with this this is what i would be concerned about if you went with this this is what i would be concerned about therefore i would i would say that the best solution for you is blah but it is your choice so there is some of that happening as well um i think it it it's a cop out, I think, a lot of times, in my opinion. My cat is eating a plant that yeah. will make him throw up. Oh, good. <laughs> um, but the the I think the unwillingness in a lot of cases for physicians to necessarily go into that is because they in some cases they may not know necessarily like really what is the current research or background or you know mm -hmm. you know what are the statistics what is the most of it like so my experience is when a doctor is answering something with no additional feedback other than, well, it's up to you. These are my recommendations and not giving any other information. It's a cop out. Huh. That's my thought. That's something I'll have to explore more because that's, that's newer to me. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if malpractices are part of it because like we said, it is a, it's the medical practice it is a science. Things can unfortunately go wrong, even when you do your best to stay diligent to the research and understanding and, and there's complications, but it wouldn't surprise. So it wouldn't surprise me if that's kind of part of the fear in there at this point. Yeah. People come like, you told me to do this and it led to that. Right. Yeah. So I had something else I wanted to say. Now I forget. Hmm. Well, that's probably a good summary of labs. <laughs> probably. Probably a good summary. And, uh, yeah. So they are based on general number of people they see, which unfortunately due to insurance, hand tying is now becoming the average of less and less healthy people. Um, and pharmaceutical companies and health insurances are sort of dictating the training to and actions of doctors. And as we've talked about before many times, kind of that one thing you said from the get-go, that empowerment, that asking questions. So now we need to make sure people know, ask your doctor, ask what your are doctor. my other options? Yes. Or they literally legally cannot tell you some things. Yep. Ask about complications, ask about side effects, ask about this, that, and the other thing. And then also remember if it is a chronic illness, like doctors are great for that emergency sort of thing and that, that you know, immediate acute. But if it is a lifelong chronic illness, yeah. seek out a functional medicine practitioner. I Absolutely. don't really know how else to say it. Yeah, you don't want to just take that pill for the rest of your life. And your doctor yeah. doesn't have any other offerings for you. Find out the root cause. I mean, that's the big difference. I mean, it's a matter of, do you want a Band-Aid for a constantly leaking boo-boo, or do you want to actually fix what the problem is? It's really, it's really that simple. I mean, that's the difference between conventional and functional medicine. Yeah. It's patching, patching a Band-Aid versus fixing a problem. Yeah. And that patch is absolutely invaluable when it's needed. When it's yeah. needed. I mean, it, it can save your life. It, I mean, that patch Absolutely. can save your life, but it's yeah. not build from there. Yeah. I was going to say it, it's, it's saved your life. It does not mean that you are going to be able to thrive or sustain that because sustain. whatever caused that problem, unless you address it, it is going to continue to accumulate. Yeah. And that patch will eventually fail. Most likely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I know that's something kind of you and I have talked about with um, like food sensitivity testing, which I don't want to dive into too much now, but yeah, it, even that, like for a long time, people were like, oh, well, if you have IBS, what's the cause? Food sensitivities. And now we're going, I'm going even deeper, like what's the cause of the food sensitivities? GI health right. um, and lifestyle. So 
So even that getting down into that deep, deep initial, what is that first domino that fell over? That yeah. over six months to six years or more led yep. to yep. Where we're at. autoimmune, diabetes, IBS, yep. arthritis, whatever. So all of it. Uh, any other closing thoughts? Um, I'm going to depart with a story. Ooh. Um, so oh. I was working at uh, the world's largest uh, research institution that's based here in Columbus. I won't name names, but um, it's the world's largest research institution and it's based here in Columbus. And we were assigned a project to uh, determine if we could predict acute kidney injury. Okay. And we were given a set of 300,000 patients who had had acute kidney injury. And could we figure out the pathways that were causing acute kidney injury? And I, now mind you, me at the time, low man on the totem pole, no PhD, working with tons of people who have PhDs, math statisticians, people who have been working at this big research institution for longer than I've been on the face of the planet and are more than willing to let me know that. Um, and I said, I was like, there is a difference biologically speaking, between men and women, period. There's a difference between men and women. And I said, let's use this example. You give a 150 pound male and a 150 pound female three shots each. There's gonna be a difference in blood alcohol content because women have less of the enzyme that produces- oh, three, three drink shots. Three, th okay. three shots, three drink shots each. Women are going to have a higher blood alcohol content because they have less of the enzyme that metabolizes alcohol. Mm -hmm. Fact. Science, right? Yes. So you could take 10, 10 men and women, 100 men and women. There's going to be, this is a clear scientifically proven difference. Now, we can do the same experiment and do it between men and women that are Caucasian and men, men and women that are Asian. Because Asians have less of the enzyme that metabolizes alcohol, which, by the way, if you're ever around it, Asians that are drinking is part of the reasons why they flush so easily. So now we've said, okay, we know that there's a biological difference in how not only men and women process alcohol, but different racial groups and different genetic groups process alcohol, right? So this is like, this is basic biology. Mm -hmm. So I said, so finally, it was like over, the, I've been pounding on this for freaking months. We're going, everybody's going away. It takes like five days to run this data set. And I said, Dave, do me a favor. While we're on break, run the date. I don't care. Just split it by men and women. I don't care about race. Just split it by men and women. And let's see what the top 20 indicators are for acute kidney injury. Just go, just splitting by men and women. Let's see what the top 20 indicators are. Because they were like, well, we don't understand why we're getting these like muddy bands, blah, blah, blah. The difference is there was absolutely like there were three crossover items in the top 20 and they were like way at the bottom. And they were things that you'd be like, well, duh, of course, that's like, that's gonna affect everybody. So here's the other take home from labs. We're blending men and women together. True, very true. Have we ever thought about the differences some do separate it out, but not some all. Do, yeah, but not but all. not all. And it's, it, I would say, in my experience, it's more of the exception than the rule. True. So, 
that's another story from from my perspective that highlights just how irreverent labs can be when not utilized properly when not individualized when not, not individualized personalized. when not personalized very true it's very important so there you go that's my you that's go. another that's your story hopefully that, that's at a, home yep yeah awesome well thank you for chatting again today as always uh, was always a pleasure can't wait to do it again <laughs> next week and if not people if you have demands tell us let us know we like to talk <laughs> clearly <Really? laughs> but it's important it is yeah. and that's so i'm glad we're doing this because it does frustrate me sometimes the lack of awareness and therefore the barriers that get run into because people don't understand where these numbers are coming from where these rules are coming from where these restrictions are coming from they don't even realize there are restrictions and rules and well, that why can they, be limiting their ability to feel their best right and and i was gonna say and the downstream impacts and limitations that that then puts the constraints that that puts on them i mean it's really yeah yeah so functional medicine give it a try give it a shot so stay empowered stay strong find out how to thrive. Thanks for listening. And as always, reach out if you have any questions or want to talk more. Please like, follow, subscribe, or share, and let me know what you want to know more about. These interviews are shared on both YouTube as video and as audio on podcasts um, from various platforms, including Spotify and Amazon Music. I am lining up more guests and interviews, and I would love to help answer your health and fitness questions. So keep that support rolling.